afternoon and welcome to another segment of Above or Beyond Reasoning. Today, my special guests are Dr. Hope Shaw and Dr. Erica Crew, and they're joining me from Florida. And today is a special afternoon because these two ladies both went to high school together, Montego Bay High School, and they're both trained nurses. I'll say more about that a little later. Now, today in our series, we're talking about COVID-19 and the health sector. This is going to be very informative. Now, let me tell you a little bit more about Dr. Ku. Dr. Ku is a doctor of medicine, and she also holds a master's in community health, and she's also a certified health educational specialist. And she practices family medicine at her own practice in Florida, Model Medical Group. Now, Dr. Shaw, she went to Kingston School of Nursing, and I must say that for my Jamaican listening. And she's a published author, and she earned her PhD at Barry University, where her research area was mental illness. Now, ladies, we're going to jump right into it. I mean, COVID 19 caught us totally off guard. I don't think anybody had a playbook for this. And as we look at the health sector, you know, that's right on the front line. You know, manufacturing, education, tourism, entertainment, you know, on the sidelines. <laughs> but you are in the heat of the battle. And today we want to start by asking you, um, you well, hold, start, start with you, Dr. Pooh. Who has this impacted you personally and your institution? Uh, personally, it's more, I would say it's just, has created so much distance with yourself, son, yourself your family and your clients as well. But in regards to the business, I would say with the clients, um, it has significant impact to the business. We are really down. We're seeing some, you know, a little up now. We're getting a little, more patients now but initially we had everybody had to stay home so doing that everybody had to we couldn't get in the office and even if i could i wouldn't be able to because then we were also lacking um equipment for work the ppes that we needed and everything was diverted to hospitals we had orders in at the time and they were just they just stopped them cold turkey nobody brought in anything no explanation so we were home trying to figure out how we're going to get this thing together well luckily before all of this started i was doing some telehealth for a company so i said to myself hey i have to figure out a way how to see my patients to keep that bond with them the relationship with them so i don't lose them so then we merged into the telehealth so even though we were doing that we were still not up to par in regards to how much the business was impacted, because you find out most of my patients are elderly. I would say they are above 50 years old, and a great number of them are above 80. So they weren't too much into this equipment. They couldn't do much. So the, the fact that we were only able to see a few patients in office, I would have to reach out to a few of them who were not able to use the telehealth platform and get them in the office to kind of train them and send them back home. So if they had situations, you know, pop up during this period of time, they'll be able to call in and then we'll be able to, to um, see them virtually. Okay, before we get a little bit more into that, I want you to jump in here, Hope. Um, how were you personally impacted being on the other side more in education, health education, as against being actually being on the front line dealing with, with, um, with patients, whether public or private? Um, I can say, Sandra, that I, I'm not going to speak on, say, from a perspective of, you know, the organization that right. I work Your personal, with. yeah. Yeah, but my personal experience, because I can speak as an informed health professional, I can speak as a mother, I can speak as a wife, I can speak as a daughter, a friend, you name it, but coming from the health professional standpoint and here in South Florida, it depended on 
where which organization you work and you know i kept as far as my pulse on the situation um i would say on a day-to-day -day basis that i think that we were proactive in just basically getting into what we call a preparation mode and even being in that preparation mode the level of anxiety i can tell you to this it may have waned somewhat but it's still there because um, I can tell you, even just picking up the newspaper this morning um, and seeing that basically it's trending up again, um, we can already feel that level of anxiousness coming back. Uh, when I thought about coming onto the program today to talk with you, um, I started reflecting on um, the stuff that I learned when I was in nursing school. Um, we had this acronym called um, DABDA, and DABDA really is denial, anger, bargaining, and depression, and finally acceptance, which we all go through in, in that coping and, and death phase. And COVID-19 to me feels like I am in this regurgitating state of DABDA every time. Oh no, it's not coming back. Oh my God, I can't believe it's coming back. I am getting angry and then this bargaining, make it happen somewhere else and not us. I wish it was them and not us. Um, and then, of course, the, the depression state that is actually very personal to me, you know, one from a research standpoint, um, where I did that um, when I did my um, uh, postgrad work. Uh, but then this final acceptance and the state of mind that we are in with COVID-19 feels like it is a constantly evolving state. We're literally mirroring the disease. How, how are you both responding? Um, Erica, you can go first. You started to talk about your response earlier. And uh, I, I'm seeing where there is a suggestion from some quarters that we have had a decline in the number of patients coming in for regular elective procedures and just for their general checkups and so on because of the fear again, you know. So how have you been responding? And how are the patients responding? To be honest with you, I, I don't want to say I've always thought something bad was gonna happen, but no matter how much you've prepared for the bad days, you can never fully prepare. So for me, there's, you know, I spoke to somebody the other day and I said, it, it has been so many months I've held one of my, my, well, my son, I've not hugged my sons in months. And um, you have to get, to, sometimes you get to the point where initially you, you're, you're home with your spouse and having to go there, you're seeing these individuals and you, you get home and you don't even want to go near your, your husband mm. or your children, hoping that, you know, you're thinking that something bad is going to happen. Then after a while, as Hope is saying about the dabda, you get to the point where it's, I don't know if it's a bargaining uh, mode you get into and you're saying, what if, what not, and you're arguing with yourself. And then you get to the point and you said, you know what? I'm just going to be with my husband, whether or not this is going to happen, we'll, we'll fight it together. And your attitude, you know, something, it's the same that some of my patients go through. It's fear. One, one individual I have, she doesn't have a mental issue. She, she came, she says, I have to see you. So I said, all right, get your mask and come on in. She says, I can't do this anymore. So they get to the point, they're lonely. They, she says, I can't, I can't talk, I can't go over to see my neighbor. I have to stay from a foreign wave to her and I'm talking to my machine. Yes. She sews and she's arguing with her machine has become an individual to her that she can vent to. She says, I don't want to do this today. And you're looking, you're over there looking at me as if I have to, you're telling me I must get up and do something. Because what it is, she, she wants to sew, but she's not ready. So because of how the, 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 the COVID has, what, ha, what it has done, um, separated individuals, separated families, mm -hmm. it has caused individuals now, we've seen an uptick of mental problems, which I think Hope would be better able to yeah. speak about. <laughs> so 
we, I know she's not crazy. I know she's not going through a mental phase. So it has affected them. So there's still an air of fear. And when we see this new, um, the, the news now, where especially Florida now, is getting vast amount of cases. We're now going back into this fear mode. We were just kind of relaxing. I know we're going back into the fear mode. And I can tell, anytime you start hearing the news, patient starts calling in and canceling the appointment. Yes. And they're asking, can we do this another way? So it's, it's affected everybody, I would say, one way or the other. If it hasn't affected financially, because I was just telling Hope, I'm going to have to find myself another job. Because it's not like you, it's your own business. So you're yeah. not, that's your source of income. And it's significantly gone down to where you're, if you're not careful, you can't even take care of your bills. So, you know, it's, it, it has yeah. really impacted us financially, socially. Um, I would say intimately, in a lot of ways, it has impacted us. And because we're experiencing this, I don't think we're any bit different from the patients. Being, education, being educated about the whole matter may put you at two and two. It can be good and bad. It can be negative. It can be positive. But it puts you in an era where you can understand a little better. These individuals who have no clue what's going on, you just imagine the fear they're, they're having. Exactly. And I think that is why um, we are seeing where, you know, it, it, it is looking based on the projections, which is a little bit worrying that a lot of family physicians may find that they may be going out of business if they are not able to pivot and adapt to this new normal, which we're going to talk about a, 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 little, a little bit more. I'm, I'm understanding that you know some hospitals are strapped for cash because the resources are all focused in one direction. So your elective procedures and other things are not yeah. done, and then you won't have enough money to pay workers. You know some hospitals have had to lay off persons and so on. So jumping right here, I mean, what is the impact that you have seen before we get into you know response? So two concepts come to mind every time I think of our current state, and it's altruism and solidarity. Mm -hmm. So there are two actions that we hear about all the time with social distancing, when you're, whether you're at home with the space opening that we've gone into, going out to restaurants, going out to the supermarket, and it's wearing masks and social distancing. And with the wearing the mask and the social distancing, I look at people around me. I also internalize with myself and have these conversations. I don't think I have spoken to myself more. I've, I think I've spoken to myself more than ever since COVID-19 than ever before. And I, you know, I had to smile when I hear Erica talk about the patients, them having talking with these machines. You know, and it's this internal, um, and sometimes it is a conflict, is am I going to do this action because I know it is going to be benefit the good, or am I going to stand in solidarity with the ones who are not wearing masks, not doing social distancing, because, hey, so, you know, COVID-19 is here, and it's here to stay. Um, for how long, we don't know. But to your point, um, Sandra, it, it is become our new norm. And the new norm is when does it not become new anymore are questions that I ask myself. Uh, but <laughs> like I said before, every time I think of social distancing and mask wearing, it has become part of our day-to-day -day life. I sh not so much struggle, but I have these conversations with myself and wonder what other people are thinking about based on the concepts of being altruistic mm -hmm. or are they gonna be standing in solidarity? Yeah, yeah. Well, we see where the research which keeps coming out and keeps changing <laughs> as well is telling us that social distancing and wearing of masks do help with you know, slowing down the, the transmission. Now, as we pivot in this new normal, Healthcare is probably the primary requirement outside air and food. Um, 
bar any sector at all. Um, what is it that institutions and you know healthcare providers, whether they, they be private or public, uh, will have to do to respond to this new normal? You know, as we turn the spotlight on, you know, maybe integration, which is sharing data more among the different um, areas, um, use of technology, as was touched on earlier, and maybe a different approach to how we charge for services, you know, a, 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 an approach like a value-based approach compared to maybe just a fee for service, since persons may not want to come in at all um, because of these reasons. And uh, it's not just the healthcare provider, but on both sides, you both have to be concerned. You know, we know that persons have given their lives and that's the, you know, what else can you give because they're trying to take care of others. Uh, when I looked at how many doctors in Italy who died, um, 200, it's, it's really high. So jump in here for me, Erica, you know, how is it that the health sector needs to pivot and how is it pivoting and, you know, are we going in a different direction and seeing a new normal? Your, turn on your mic for me, please. Yeah, we're going into a new direction. And this is, I don't know, as Hope said, we don't know how new this normal is going to keep being new or if we're going to change and get used to it. It's very hard. Um, and I see, I can see what, what you said to when you said a lot of private practitioners are going to close. And I, I am a stubborn individual. I'm on the verge of that, but I'm going to keep going. And I'll tell you why. You have some loyal patients, and we, we've been having situations now and having to be going into forums like this where people, doctors are abandoning their patients, basically. They cannot reach them. So they, they, they don't know where to turn. So we see the upturn in telemedicine. So that's one aspect where individuals are turning. And we, it's not as financially viable because you have a great number of the population who cannot access the, the platforms. They can't really use it. Quite a number, I would say a good percentage of the elderly can still do that. But some can't and some won't because they want that feel, they want, I don't feel like I'm really touching base with a patient unless I see them. We've had to implement changes in, 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 in our practice. We just started out again and looking, thinking that we're going to have to stop again. So it's a, it's a stop and go business. So we stopped, we reevaluated re the situation and we said, you know what, we can get back in. So I've had to, I had sliding glass at the front at the, the res reception area. Now we had to change it to plexiglass and keep them fixed with a little pocket underneath where the patient is just only able to slide under the, 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 the documents and collect something from you. So it's like what we used to in Jamaica as a little shop window. So we've had to fix those now. So no, no longer are you able to face the individual. You are, you know, we don't slide the windows anymore. It's plexiglass. We can see them. I, I have had, I don't have staff now. It's just me. So I let them in. If say one comes at nine, I lock, let the person in, make sure they have you, ahead of time. You let them know you're, you're, you're asking them to wear a mask not to come through the front door un until it's the exact time for their appointment. So if you turn up 8.30 with a nine o'clock appointment, you're not going to be let in until nine o'clock. When you come through that door, have a mask on. There's hand sanitizer. We can't even find refills for the big containers now. So I personally squirt it in their hands, seat them. I, I have an instrument. You can't touch them now to do th temperature. You have to use a little gun ther thermometer to check them. So it's changing so that I used to love to hug my patients. They come in, I hadn't seen them for a while. I have a lot of snowbirds. They go away and they're back from, the, from north. You want to hug them. You can't do that anymore. So it's, it's, it has changed that aspect of it. And then the glass in front now, it's like they're sitting over there 10 feet away it's just us in the office and I'm interviewing them 10 feet away. Then they come inside and before they get in, they already have a questionnaire online that they fill out. Some can't. Well, you have a couple of questions you ask them when they enter about the COVID. They come in, 
and half, some of them will hide. And then you get to the room and by the time you get in there, you hear them coughing or something else is going on. So we have now have to, we have had to be changing, distancing ourselves. The social distancing is, it's not the best, how, you know, you're practicing medicine. So we need PP, PP, the, the PPE to, to be able to practice medicine. Exactly. How am I going to take it, um, look in your ears if I can't come close to you? Or am I going to listen to your heart if I'm not able to get close to you? So the equipment that we need to do this work, it's not been handed down to us in any bulk amount that we can continue to do service. It's shooted out to the hospitals who are having greater needs. So that's where once, and we don't have a choice in the matter, or we're going to have to spend considerable amount of money to, acu um, to, to acquire these goods, you know? So the market is making money off of it. They're prospering because no, the, 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 demand, the, the demand is greater. So that's one aspect. So we have to have the distancing. We have to change our situations where patients have to wash hands. We have to have hand sanitizer. So it's costing us more to take care of the patient. And we are seeing less of patients. Because, uh, and working more. So when, when, sh when that patient is done and goes through the door, I have to clean that room myself. Then get ready for the, the next room. And I rotate like that through the day. So by the end of the day, you have more work. You haven't touched your notes. You haven't done your referrals. You haven't sent in your prescriptions because you're just trying to keep the place clean and healthy for them and for yourself. Noted, noted. Oh. Yes. Um, just kind of ruminating on some of the thoughts that uh, Erica just shared. And uh, I couldn't help but reflect that when we question how has healthcare changed, we have to look at it from two aspects. We have to look at it, one, as providers, you know, myself, I'm in education, um, and, and Erica, of course, as a physician, but also we need to look at it as patients. You know, we always say, put yourselves in the patient's shoes and understand what they go through. Uh, this morning, for instance, I went to get my uh, an ultrasound done, but I already had a phone call coming in and giving me instructions that I need to have my insurance card, I need to have my driver's license. Um, they've already contacted the insurance company. This is how much it's gonna cost. Um, make sure that you have a mask. mask. So I get into that preparation mode. So remember now I'm speaking from a perspective now as a patient and I'm thinking, wow, this has changed so much. But then also as what we talk about what I mentioned earlier on as that altruistic individual going in already thinking that I want to spend as little time as possible in this environment because there is this COVID-19, this new normal that is still, it's, 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 it's coming back. It's here again because we have seen the surges here in Florida. So there were times, you know, going in and sitting into a doctor's office and, you know, I, you know, waiting for them to ask me for these cards. Not anymore. When I handed it to the receptionist, he looked at me and he was like, oh, you're ready. I mean, I was hand, I handed him my, my card knowing that my copay was going to be $50. When he asked me to, um, to sign the form, the receipt, I noticed a credit of $132. So I was giving the institute, the organization more money on top of credit that I already had on my account. And that was in a haste to get out of the place as quickly as possible. So in a nutshell, it has changed. It has changed how healthcare is delivered. But I'm still also thinking on two points that you mentioned, Sandra, when you talk about value-based care and fee-for-service. Value-based care is very much weaved into how we're doing care here in the United States. You know, that's ingrained in the CMS policy. We do things that we call hate HCAPs, 
you know, uh, ever so often in the year. Um, and that affects how much reimbursement the hospital gets. So, I mean, if I was to, to look into a, a, a to try to in, even just to think of what the future may look like, I can maybe foresee that integration of value base and fee for service all you know working together that and telehealth which i still think to a large extent has a lot of is still opaque we don't know where that is going to go but i don't think value based medicine is going to go away um, there's still a lot of the the political and economics that is weaved into the way how the healthcare system here in the states work so um, I think there is still, we're working with so many unknowns right now that I can tell you one as a, as a, as a, as a healthcare provider, I, you know, back to my DAPTA, I am in anxiety again. Um, as a patient, I still am in anxiety again. Um, but because of a second phase, and having experienced that first phase, as we call it, the anxiety is still tied in with some acceptance mm -hmm. and thinking of best ways how we can mitigate and basically preserve more life. Um, who is at risk never ever leaves my mind. You know, I looked at some data um, just yesterday that the CDC posted and two things stood out to me. It is the individuals who have comorbidities and they're male. And of course we know, and we've seen the data on our black pop on, 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 you know, here we say African-Americans, but on blacks and on minorities and people who are poor and they are at risk. So, you know, I think of these, you know, these three, I call it, uh, uh, uh variables, or subsets or you know pieces that I wonder what are we doing now that we've experienced COVID-19 and this is our new normal. What are we doing to make sure that we are, you know, we are protecting this vulnerable um, group, not just oh, here in the would, United States. Would you, would you, but in say, the world. Would you say hope that maybe, just maybe, out of this experience called COVID-19, there could be some opportunities. I mean, some things have happened in the space of the last two, three months in, in medicine, healthcare in general, that would have taken years to happen because things were just going so slowly. Um, mm -hmm. Could it be that there's an opportunity for us to pivot to a new normal where telehealth, uh, telemedicine, you know, for those who are up with the technology and those who need to get up with the technology, you know, that could be a new opportunity to, mm -hmm. to, to treat with persons, not necessarily in the same locale, to get a second opinion on something from a doctor who could be miles away in another country, mm -hmm. another state. Um, mm -hmm. And will, will the powers that be, you know, lean into that new normal? because that could mean a lot of changes in how things are done, how things are processed, how payments are made, what you charge for, what you don't charge for, you know, how do you look at, you know, a face-to-face -face visit and against, you know, an online visit or a telephone visit. Um, so much to think of, as you said, the uncertainties, but are there opportunities for, for the health sector and all the players to be going in a totally new direction to make it for everyone? Yes, Sandra, not just for telehealth, actually for even, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm, I haven't seen it yet. I'm wondering, you know, teleeducation. I'm an educator. I have done more, what, what I call, I have done, I've done more work preparing to upload programs into an online or a virtual forum than I have had in face-to-face -face meetings. So yes, with all these threats, with the threat of COVID-19 is a lot of opportunity, but we cannot, we have to think about the economics of it. It's not just, oh, telehealth is popular, let's do it. 
there's it, it's going to take a lot of um not necessarily ingenuity but basically work needs to be put into researching basically how this is going to be constructed and it may not be suitable for every group it may not be suitable for every area but there definitely is an opportunity for that um, i am happy to see in some areas where we're seeing and i'm, I'm going to shift a little bit away from telehealth we're doing i've never seen on um onboarding done for employees done virtually i mean that's new so we're now thinking wow did we really need to bring this group of employees in um, and, and to, to have them in this whole setting for X amount of time? How much more efficient? I think that's one of the words that I hear being used a lot since COVID-19. How can we, you know, oh my God, we're actually doing this a little bit more efficiently, uh, repurposing people, um, to Erica's point, with individuals who are now basically being whether laid off, being furloughed, um, lack of work. Uh, I can share with you that I have worked in, uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in an environment where I have had to think outside of the box and make proposal and say, wow, um, this area of work is not busy, but this area is short of a certain group of people. Can we train these higher functioning individual to now do a task to fill a need here. So I've seen where we can actually repurpose people in other areas of work. So telehealth definitely I think is gonna be an amazing opportunity for some, not everybody, uh, but I don't think it should be something that you just jump in and do just because it's popular. Um, and we have to basically be able to show how it is still benefiting you know the patient the doctors who their doctors who want to see their patients so that may not be suitable for them so there are groups of people who will actually run with this um and 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 actually show the the you know well the benefits need to outweigh if you want to call it the risk of doing this type of uh, of patient care okay yes yes just cut in here. Yeah, I was gonna be. I was just gonna comment on that because it, it cannot be exclusive. You can't say I'm just gonna stay home every day and exclusively see my, my patient via telehealth. Because the same responsibility you have to come up with a diagnosis that fits the patient, um, you you're still liable doing it via telehealth. So if you don't have the the, the skills behind it and the 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 the, 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 and the altruistic behavior behind it and you're just thinking about hey you know what i can i can do this i can see 40 patients just sitting on the computer and absolutely instead of going in and physically examining 20 for the day and, and you know it's 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 paying less but then you have to see more to make to to, to to break even but it cannot be done exclusively whereas i can stay home and i can say you know what to my patient check your blood pressure what is your blood pressure all right, do this, do this. I'm going to call you back in two weeks, like I would in the office. But an individual calls and she says, like, I'm having terrible belly pains. I can't do that telemedicine. I can't examine her. I can't listen to her bowels telemedicine. So if, this, if we're heading into a direction of telehealth, there are lots of other things we're going to have to do. And we're going to have to do them in such a way that it becomes um accessible to, to the individuals like say okay maybe there let's create a stethoscope that the person can use at home so set it up in such a way that i can hear your bowel sounds or i can hear your heartbeat or when you take a breath i can hear so if we're starting in that line we, it there's far and wide so there's some positives to it but where we are right now and the economics of things, it cannot be done exclusively. And as Hope is saying, it can't be for everybody. And I, you know, I preempted this before. There are some individuals who will not be able to use the system. I have patients who can just do the phone, and that's fine. I'll be able to talk to them. I know them. But it's harder when you don't know them and you're having to do this by phone. We've been very generous in the COVID season because I've been covering, 
I can't tell you how many states license I had over the last couple of weeks that were given to me in emergency wise, not South Carolina, North Carolina, Iowa, Ohio. I do still have a legitimate Florida and New York state license. So what we've been doing for New York state, which has eased them up a lot, we were going through the FDNY, that's the fire department, and we were taking those patients who would call the 911 numbers. They would come to us as physicians. We triage them. We'll determine whether or not they are true emergencies that need to be going into the ED. Otherwise, we do telehealth and we took care of them. We sent, we sent their medication via, via e-script. We did that. So we, we, we helped to, to take the burden off of the, the hospitals. But for how long can you do that? It can't be done exclusively because the, we, there has to be some formal contact for some um, procedures. Some things we have left on the, on the scale, but I, could, I had to go into a procedure. I couldn't leave my patient with an abscess who is compromised to go into an emergency room or urgent care to get that sorted out. I went in and I did it myself. So there are some things that requires your, your presence there. So there's a, there's a good deal of it technology-wise, but it is going to require a lot more branches to for right, it to There come. is so much here to unpack. I mean, as we pull it all together, I mean, we have looked at, you know, how we have responded individually how the health sector has responded, public and private, how the patients are being impacted, you know, what we're accustomed to and what seems to be going away that may not be coming back. It's, I mean, COVID-19 is here. It's not like it's just going to disappear overnight. Um, it's about adapting. And, uh, you know, as, as I listen to both of you ladies speak, I mean, I think of how can we get more efficient? I, I think about things that were, were taking months and weeks and years to do, like, you know, permits, um, licensing, things that just had to be done because of what was going on. You know, training, how do we even onboard persons, as Hope was saying, and even the bigger picture about professionals in the healthcare sector, how do we retrain them for this new normal? Because the approach to everything has to be different, you know, the thinking outside of the box, um, you know, as, as Hope was mentioning. But I'm, I'm going to have each of you give your last word as we wrap up, you know, as we look towards the future. It is a new normal. We're not going to, to going back to what was. We have to adapt somehow. And I would want to think that we can make it better based on all that we have learned. Um, one of the main things it's been is that, you know, public health um, is, is wrapped up in private health care. You know, they, they, they are so intertwined. You cannot be healthy and be protected if others are not protected and not healthy <laughs> because we all occupy the same space here called Earth. Um, over to you, Hope. You want to give me your last words and then, um, Erica, you can wrap up. So much to unpack. <laughs> Um, it, it's so interesting that, you, you know, we could talk about this, I call it for hours, because we haven't even tapped into what is going on in the emergency room and what is happening in pediatric care and how COVID-19 has impacted that service as it relates to immunization and, and individuals who are having um, uh, myocardial infarcts or strokes who are not presenting to the emergency care. But uh, I want to end on, uh, on, a, on a quote that was made uh, by David Abrams, who is a professor of social and behavioral science at NYU. And he says that humans tend to long for a sense of belonging in uncertain times. We are in uncertain times. Um, but on my note, and this is outside of um, Professor Abrams, is I pause to think of what opportunities does COVID-19 affords people like myself. The new normal is the new normal um, for however long it lasts. But I know that people like myself, like Erica, like you who have afforded us a forum like this, 
messaging is very important. We have to listen to the scientists. We have to listen and watch the data. And at the end of the day, as a, as a group, as human beings existing on this planet for, it's not an infinite period of time, I believe I will pick altruism over being solidarity, over solidarity. Erica, your last word. Yeah, so I'm, I'm listening to Hope and I had jotted down a little thing to say here that irrespective of the social distancing, we have to learn to be our brother's keeper. Um, there are individuals who are struggling and, and, and a friend of mine said, if COVID doesn't break your pocket, it's gonna break you somehow, mentally, break your heart somehow. The, the, the part of what we're, a lot of us are not seeing is, the, is, the, is the, the distancing, not just the social distancing on the street, but it's when you have individuals who go into the hospitals, how lonely that is, how much some of them die alone. I have a patient, I have to, keep him, I have to be having him on medication. He went up to New York for his son who died in the hospital, never got a chance to see nothing. He was cremated like a day after. So we, we, we haven't seen the, 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 if the negative effects. We're, they're not showing that to us because I think they don't want to throw us into fear. And there's really no need for that. But we are not quite sure exactly how COVID is, 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 is looking as we speak because there's mutation. It's, it's a virus. And that's what it does. So if they come out and say, the scientists come out and say, do this, we can follow them. Will the trend change? Yes, it may. And sometimes it really does because the virus mutates, there are changes. And I just tell my kids, I said, pretend this is tuberculosis and it's spread, it's airborne and that's how, you, that's how you're gonna pick it up. So I, my advice now or what I would want to leave is for us to just continue to practice our social distancing, use our mask in open spaces and be, be wary of the next person, be, be, be our brother's keepers. Ha, if we can't do that, we're not going to go through this. We can't choose to be together if we choose to be stubborn and disobedient. Excellent point, ladies. You know, knowledge is what is there is so much misinformation going around and I am so happy that both of you were able to join us this afternoon you know to share with our audience you know what's going on on the front line in your individual spheres we thank you so much um, Dr. Hope Shaw, Dr. Erica Cook, you know Jamaicans making their mark in Florida um, we thank you for what you do you know, we, we can't say thanks enough to our healthcare providers and those who are on the front line fighting the good fight. Thank you so much and continue doing what you do best. Um, our prayers are with you and all the others in the fight. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks for having us. You're welcome.